Let me introduce Professor Norman Billingham, who's going to talk about plastics in amateur radio. Emeritus Professor, I should say. Yeah. Long, long retired. Thank you for... Thank you for coming. When Stuart, uh, is the microphone signal all right for you? Right. When Stuart asked me to do this talk, I thought that's actually quite impossible to talk about plastics in 35 minutes. It used to take me 24 lectures when I did it at university level. Um, if we're going to talk about soft materials, you have to start somewhere. And we're talking about modern materials. So my starting point is the end of the 15th century, which is the point where we discovered America. And th the original settlers in America found a material they'd never seen before. The, the Aboriginal population, the natives, the Mayans, the Incas, were using a material which we now call rubber. Uh, and those settlers were absolutely fascinated by rubber because they thought it was more alive than anything they'd seen before. It was elastic. Uh, the Mayans played a ball game with rubber. We've no idea uh, how they did it, but we know that they were able to process rubber. Uh, the first mention of, in Europe that I'm aware of is in 1530, uh, first written mention. What followed was essentially 300 years of total failure because people took rubber and to the east coast of America and into Europe and tried to make waterproof things from it and tried to make bouncy things from it. And it was a complete failure more or less because things either turned soft and sticky and gluey and smelled horrible or they turned brittle and hard and cracked and failed. Uh, it took th about 300 years before it was tamed and it was tamed by three men who were all essentially friends at part of the time and, and bitter rivals at, at, for other parts of the time, suing each other. Uh, the first was a man called Thomas Hancock in 1820. And he discovered that if you take natural rubber uh, and you grind it up between spiked rollers, we, we'd nowadays call it maceration or, or mechanochemical processing, but he called it pickling. Uh, you produced a rubber which was much better, which, which had much better properties. It was picked up by Charles Mackintosh uh, who was experimenting with distillation of coal tar. Uh, and he found that you could take the very light solvent fractions from coal tar, you could dissolve rubber in it, you could spread it on a fabric, and you could make waterproof, waterproof cloth. Uh, and that's why when you still, when you go out in the rain, your mum tells you to make sure you've got your Mac with you. Uh, that's, that's where the name comes from. But the real star success was Charles Goodyear. Uh, Charles Goodyear in 1839 uh, after many, many years of, of impoverishing himself with all kinds of experimentation, discovered that if you take rubber and process it with sulfur, uh, you can dramatically improve its properties. Uh, he called the process vulcanization. Uh, we, we still talk about vulcanized rubber as a, as a material. And that was followed by Nelson Goodyear, his brother, in the 1840s, discovered that if you keep going, if you keep adding sulfur to rubber and heating it and processing it, you can produce a hard, rigid, brittle material. Uh, he called it vulcanite, or hard rubber. Uh, we nowadays tend to call it ebonite. And ebonite was one of the sort of key materials in the beginnings of, of, of radio technology because it provided us with a radio frequency insulator. Uh, it wasn't only used to make the knobs on the front, uh, it was used to make the, the, the coil formers and the valve bases and all sorts of bits inside because you could, you could make complicated objects from it. I've shown some jewelry there, but, but radio would work too. That's a natural material. You're simply taking a natural polymer, rubber, and, and modifying it. Uh, the first synthetic materials really associated with this guy, James Swinburne. Uh, Swinburne's a bit of a hero of mine. He, he was an electrical engineer, not a chemist. Uh, he was born in 1848 and died in 1948, just short of his 100th birthday. Um, and he was one of these people who could think outside the box and realize that the problem with electrical engineering was not con conduction electricity, it was insulation. How do you keep the electrons in the wire and not floating around all over the place? And he, showed, he found that if you take phenol and formaldehyde and you mix them together under slightly acidic conditions, you could make a sort of amber, treacly amber resin, which you could coat onto wire and then bake, and it would form a, a tough insulating layer. Uh, he set up a company to make it. It was called the Damard Lacquer Company. Uh, the name is apparently about the properties of the material. It's Damard stuff. Um, <laughs> it wasn't an enormous success. He was, a better, he was a better entrepreneur than he was a businessman. But more or less the same time, that same idea was picked up in Belgium uh, by a guy called Leo Bakerland. Uh, and he found that if you mix phenol and formaldehyde under the right conditions, 
you can make molding compounds out of it. He was a modest sort of chap, so he called it Bakelite. And of course, it's the founding material of, of the modern radio age. It was, it was possible to mold large objects from Bakelite, not just the casings of radios, that's a 1932's Echo radio, and of course we're all familiar with the old black Bakelite telephones, uh, but all sorts of inside stuff, and it's, it's still in use. There was actually a company that made coffins out of Bakelite, although I don't think it was a great, it was, it was a particularly star success. Though Bakelite and, and phenol formaldehyde are what we would call thermosetting materials. You can make something out of it, but once you've made it, that's it, it's fixed. The first thermoplastic materials, materials which you can process more than once, were developed by a man, another Birmingham chemist, a man called Alexander Parks, and he was playing around with cellulose nitrate, nitrocellulose. There was a great deal of interest in that period, we're talking about the Napoleonic Wars, there was a great deal of interest in making explosive materials, and nitrocellulose is a very good explosive material. Uh, what Parks discovered was that if you mix it with castor oil, uh, you can soften it. Cellulose nitrate itself is a very hard, brittle, rigid material. You can soften it and you can make something which you can mold. And he produced mouldings from it. That particular one belongs, is now in the property of the, of the Science Museum. Uh, again, it wasn't a particular success, um, mainly because the castor oil tends to leach out and form sticky, sticky messes. But, but it led to a huge range of developments in, in processing cellulose. In the 1860s, uh, Hyatt in America um, plasticized cellulose nitrate with camphor and made celluloid. In just the same way that the rubber industry was, it was enabling technology for, for the motor car and the bicycle by developing pneumatic tires, the celluloid industry basically created the film industry. It, it, it's impossible to move glass plates in front of a projector at 24 per second uh, in any sensible way, but you can do it very easily once you have a, once you have a moving film. Uh, in 1891, Bernillo uh, invented rayon, basically taking cellulose and modifying it so that you could solubilize it, spin it through, a, uh, through little holes and make a new fiber. Uh, Brandenburger developed cellophane, which was done by producing a thin, extruding through a thin slit. Uh, and the, the Dreyfus brothers made a major advance in 1927 by showing that you could take the nitrate out of cellulose nitrate and replace it with acetate. And that had a huge advantage because nitrate is an explosive and it burns like fury. And those of you who know anything about early cinema history will know that cinema is quite commonly burnt down uh, in the early days because as soon as if the, you had a carbon arc lamp at the back generating a huge amount of heat, a moving film, if the film stopped moving, it was on fire in fractions of a second. The problem with all of these materials was that nobody actually had a clue what they were doing. Uh, chemists in the early 1900s believed that you couldn't have big molecules. They believed that there was a certain, or at least many chemists believe, that there was a certain limit to how large a molecule can be before it will fall to pieces. And that really limited what they could do. The solution came from this guy, Hermann Staudinger. Uh, Staudinger was the first man to really prove that these modified natural materials, nitrocelluloses, the proteins of our body, the albumins, the rubbers, all of these sticky, sticky soft materials are actually polymers. They're made by linking together very large numbers of very small molecules over and over and over again into very, very, into very, very long chains. Uh, he won the Nobel Prize for that in 1953. Uh, it, the Nobel Prize was somewhat delayed because uh, Staudinger stayed in Germany during the Nazi era, era and there was some suspicion of his, of his motives, but it was a very well justified Nobel Prize. Once chemists know what they're doing, they tend to be very good at doing it. And the result was an absolute explosion in technology as people, as people started to devise ways of linking small molecules together to make plastics. And these are the, these are the growth figures. This starts in about 1950. It's essentially down at zero in, in, in the 1930s. By the end of this decade, we're probably going to be making about 350 million tons a year of one sort of polymer or another uh, around the world. It's flattening off in Europe. It's becoming too expensive to make plastics in Europe. We, we, we now buy them from the Middle East and, and, and process them. But worldwide, it's been an absolute explosion. If you look at where they, what, what, which ones we're using, the market is actually totally dominated by two materials, low density well, polyethylenes of one sort or another and, and polypropylene. About half the total plastic that we use in the world 
is, is hydrocarbon, polyethylene, polyolefin. Uh, after that, you have PVC, uh, and then polyester, polyurethane, polystyrene, and, 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 and all sorts of other materials. But it's really dominated by those two materials for reasons we'll come back to. Essentially, they're all oil-based. But if you look at where the oil, which, which bit of the oil we use, about 9% of all the oil that, sh that we pull out of the ground is used for making petrochemicals of one sort or another. And about half of that goes into plastics. So we, the total plastics business is about 4.5% of the entire uh, output of oil. So it's not a, it's not a huge fraction. So why have, why have there been this explosion? Why are they successful? Well, I think there are a number of reasons. One is, one is the com combination of mechanical properties. You can get unique combinations of stiffness, resistance to bending, and, and toughness, resistance to breaking, from a plastic material. They're also very low density. A plastic object is 13 times less dense than the same volume of steel. Density is around 1, typically between about 0.95 and 1.25, depending on the material, provided they're not filled. But I think probably the most significant reason that they've grown so rapidly is, is that they're so easy to process. Uh, if you're an engineer and you want to make a, a gear wheel out of steel, you basically have to take a lump of steel and machine away all the bits that don't look like a gear wheel. Uh, and if you want another one, you have to do it again. Uh, with a plastic, you make a gear wheel shaped hole, you fill it with plastic, uh, and you process it, and then you can do it over and over and over again. It doesn't make much economic sense if you only want one, but if you want a million, it starts to become very, very economical. You can also process plastics from solvents, which you can't do with metals or ceramics. So you can make films and fibers and surface coatings, and you can make set-on-demand systems. You can make the polymer when you, want it to, when you want to make it, so that you can make adhesives and sealants. Uh, and increasingly now, of course, we're seeing plastics into three, as, as the fundamental basis of, three, of 3D printing, additive, additive processing. So there are a lot of reasons why this has happened. Well, let's look at them in a little more detail. We've already seen one classification, if you like. Thermoplastics are typically materials that have linear chains. That's to say they have strong chemical bonding along the chain in one direction and very weak intermolecular forces along in, in the other two directions. They soften when they heat, not always, but mostly they do, and they, and they can flow. So they can, be, they can be extruded, blown, molded, processed. And they're often soluble in, sol in an appropriate solvent. As opposed to the thermosets, which are typically this sort of cross-link cartoony structure. We have chains that are very long, but they're joined together in a, in a network, like, like molecular chicken wire. Once they're formed, they typically can't flow. They're insoluble, but they can often swell up if you put them into a suitable, into a suitable solvent. That's one classification. There isn't, if we talk about linear chains, they can be very simple. The polythene chain is just a very, very long chain of carbon atoms with two hydrogen atoms on each carbon. Uh, the cellulose chain is a very complex chain. It's, it's, it's a polymer of glucose, but essentially still linear. It only has bonds along one direction in, in the chain. If we think about thermosets, they're typically network polymers. It's impossible to draw the structure, really. That's, that's a, a little cartoony picture of a bit of the structure of a lump of bakelite. A piece of bakelite that's fully cured is essentially a single molecule. So you could carry on drawing that going out forever and a day if you, if you really wanted to. There is another way of classifying polymers, and that's really about the internal structure of the material. Most polymer chains don't crystallize. They're very bumpy. They're very irregular. Uh, they won't pack together in any significant way to form a, crystal, to form a crystalline lattice. There's no long-range order. And all network cross-link polymers are like that, and, and most common polymers are like that. There is a small number of molecules where the chain structure is very symmetrical, very linear, very few bumps on it. And they can pack into a crystal lattice. They can pack to form crystals. So we refer to these as semi-crystalline polymers. And I'll talk a bit more about those in, in just a minute. But you'll see the names there, polyamides, polyesters, polythene, cellulose. Although there aren't many polymers that will crystallize, they tend to be the ones that we find most useful. And I'll show you why in just a minute or two.
So if you think about amorphous polymers, polymers with no crystalline order, we're essentially talking about molecular spaghetti. You've got to be a bit careful with these analogies. If you took a piece of commercial polythene, the stuff that's used to make a plastic bag, and you expanded it up until the chains have the same cross-section as a piece of spaghetti, the, the average piece of spaghetti would be between the length of a double-decker bus and the length of a railway carriage. So we're talking about something which is very, very long in one dimension and very, very small in, in the other dimensions. They're entangled. They're like molecular knitting. The polymer chain is flexible. They can move around. And they form these random, these what we call randomly coiled structures. Well, if you look at the properties of one of those, they don't have melting points. You can't have a melting point without a crystal. What they have is softening points, or what, what in polymer physics terms we call the glass transition temperature. If you measure how the volume of a piece of plastic changes, a piece of amorphous plastic changes with temperature, you find there's no sharp change at any particular temperature in volume, but there is a change in expansion coefficient. There's a temperature above which the polymer chains can move around freely. The, mo the material can respond to long-range stretching deformation. That gives you the liquid or the rubber, the vis viscous liquid or rubber state. As you lower the temperature, it becomes harder and harder for chains to move. They become more and more rigid, and at some point, that, that long-range movement freezes, and the polymer can't, can't respond anymore. It goes from a liquid state to a frozen, hard, rigid glass state. This is not a true melting point in thermodynamic sense, it's a softening point. And that's crit critical to properties. I I've not taken data from any particular material here. This is just a cartoony sketch of just the elastic modulus, the stiffness of a, a material, the response to a, to, a, to, a short, to a small load as a function of temperature. And that's on a logarithmic scale. So, so each shift of one there is a power of 10 in modulus. If we're below the glass transition, nothing moves. Very, nothing moves very far. The polymer chains can't, un, can't coil and uncoil. They can't flow. It's like, if you imagine, it's a bad analogy, but if you imagine taking your bowl of cooked spaghetti and evaporating all the water out of it, you'd get something which is still entangled random coils, but it wouldn't move very much. And that's what happens below TG. If you look at the stress-strain diagram, if you stretch that material, what will happen is it'll stretch elastically over maybe one or two percent, and then it'll snap. It's hard and it's brittle because the molecules can't move very much. If you go above the glass transition, then your material becomes soft and floppy. It will still have a very small elastic range, but then it just, once, once it gets stretched, it just stretches out like a sort of gooey, treacly mess until eventually it, 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 come, it comes to pieces. So that glass transition temperature is absolutely critical. If, you, if someone comes along and says, I've made a new polymer, the first question you ask is, does it crystallize? The second question you ask is, what's its glass transition? And they vary in a huge range. So if we look, for example, silicone rubber, the lowest temperature we know has about a glass transition of about minus 125, which is why it's a good rubber for very low temperature applications. It doesn't, it doesn't freeze hard. Polyethylene's about minus 125. That may seem a bit strange, but we'll, we'll come back to that. Uh, acetal, delrin, about minus 80. Uh, nylon about 50, and the top end of the scale you have things like peak, very high performance material with a glass transition of about 145, and Nomex. Nomex is the fiber they use for Formula One drivers, overalls, the, the flame-proof fiber, and that has a glass transition of about 270. And you can't go much above that because if you go much above that, the material just pyrolyzes and degrades away and becomes useless. So that's that. What about semi-crystalline polymers? Well, as I said, there are only a few polymers that will crystallize. And even then, they can't do it completely. Imagine taking a bowl of spaghetti all cooked and, running, and trying to realign, the, trying to get it back straight into the jar. You, you can't do it. It's all tangled up with itself. So at best, in these materials, only about half of the stuff will crystallize. If you look at the X-ray scattering picture from a bit of polythene, it has, it has crystalline diffraction patterns but superimposed on a sort of amorphous halo of, of non-crystalline material. Uh, if you look at the material under, at an etched sample under an electron microscope, this is an electron microscope picture, you see these sort of rolling layers of crystals and amorphous materials all, all linked together. 
And that gives you enormous toughness because these crystals, the, the polymer chains pass through many, many crystals. They still roam around randomly through the structure, but passing through many, many, many crystals and, and locking them together. It, it means the materials tend to be translucent or opaque because the crystals scatter light. But it changes the properties dramatically. Uh, that bottom sketch there is the amorphous curve. The red one is the, is the curve for, that you'd get for a crystalline material. Below the glass transition, it doesn't matter. The, the amorphous material, the soft material in this crystalline structure, this partly crystalline structure, is still rigid. It's still frozen, glassy, and rigid. So everything is just the same. When you go through the glass transition temperature, all those crystals act to stiffen the material. The, the loss in modulus is much, much smaller than it is with an amorphous polymer. And then it stays flat, really, until you get to the melting point of the crystal. So you've got this long temperature range between the glass transition and the melting point where you have a very, very tough plastic material. This is really what we, what we mean when we talk about a plastic material, although we use the term wildly and randomly. It has a yield point, and then it flows. It stretches and stretches and stretches. Sometimes it, you can get elongations to break of three, four hundred percent before the, before the material snaps. And often what happens at the end of the process is that it hardens, and then it snaps, then it snaps. So this semi-crystallinity is extremely valuable because it gives us this property of, of, of mechanical, mechanical toughness. If you look at melting points, crystal, crystal melting points are genuine things. Silicone rubber is about minus 40. So when we use it at room temperature, it's already melted. Uh, polyethylene is somewhere around 90 to 130. Polythene is one of those terms like steel. It reflects, it, it typifies uh, dozens and dozens of different grades of material. Uh, acetal, about 175. Nylons go up into the t low 200s. Uh, Teflon is about 330. Well, Teflon is a peculiar material because it melts to a solid. Uh, peak, about 370. So we've got a, again, we've got a big range of materials. So if we take that as being a sort of background to the whole business, let's look at some of the materials that are around that we could use. Amorphous polymers with low glass transition temperatures. What that means is that the polymer chains can move around very easily because, they're, because the glass transition is, is down below the temperature of use. That really represents rubber. Rubbers are the classic materials for uh, of, this, of this category. They're, they're tip mostly thermosetting, so they're hard to process, although there are rubbers that you can process at home, Silic silicone rubbers and polyurethane rubbers that you get as, as sealants and, and, and rubber dips and so on are, are what are often called room temperature vulcanizing materials. Typical of seals, gaskets, o-rings, belts, and of course cable insulation. Uh, rubber, natural rubber cable insulation really enabled the electrical supply industry. Uh, although, of course, we would never dream of using it now. But there are huge numbers of rubbers have been developed over the decades. Natural rubber, neoprene rubber, which has chlorine in it and resists oil, uh, butyl rubber for oxygen impermeability in, in inner tubes of, of cars, silicone rubbers for low temperature application, low temperature sealing and, and room temperature vulcanized sealants. Fluorinated rubbers for high chemical resistance. Uh, and then things like styrene, betadiene, acrylonitrile, AB, ABS, uh, all used for different applications uh, and polyurethanes. And these are often very highly formulated. It's, it's very uncommon to find a piece of rubber that's a simple polymer. They're usually complicated. If you look at a, uh, at a, tire, at a car tire, there's usually several different kinds of rubber in there, plus all kinds of fillers and all kinds of other, of other chemicals. Very complex materials, but a huge range. If we go to amorphous materials with high glass transitions, so materials which are going to be stiff and rigid, these are the organic glasses. They're, they're mostly thermoplastic. Not all, but mostly. So they, they're, they're melt processable. Uh, they, they have this virtue that you can melt them, extrude them, spin them, uh, mold them. You need to be a bit careful. You see a lot of people in the, in the amateur world talking about melting, bits of, melting old milk bottles down and making hammers out of it and all kinds of other uh, domestic processing. It all works, but you need to be a bit careful. You can get some fairly toxic degradation products off these materials at high temperatures. Uh, 
because you're essentially well below the glass transition when you use these materials, they're rigid and they're often brittle. But because the structure is uniform, there's nothing to scatter light, they're usually transparent as long as you don't start putting fillers into them. So there are lots and lots of examples of that kind. Uh, polystyrene, you're all, you're all familiar with polystyrene. Uh, if you have a child like Hart, you'll remember polystyrene, the basis of the Airfix uh, plastic, plastic models. It, it's a good transparent material. It tends to be slightly yellow. It has pretty good aging resistance, although it tends to go yellow over time. It, it's got a moderately high dielectric constant, about two and a half, but it very, very low dielectric loss. The loss tangent is very, is very, very small. So it's been used quite commonly as a, as a capacitor dielectric. Uh, and those of us of a certain age can remember polystyrene lacquers that we used to paint all over our, whenever we wound coils in the days when amateurs wound their own coils for HF operation. Uh, you, would, you would tie the wire down with polystyrene varnish. varnish. Uh, you can also get it as expanded foam, and it's organosoluble, so you can dissolve it up in, in suitable solvents, and you can make lacquers, and you can make, and you can make cements. Polystyrene has been a very, very useful polymer of that kind, but rigid, rigid and quite brittle. Another workhorse of the polymer industry is, is polymethylmethacrylate. Uh, acrylic chemistry is a, is a field of its own. I mean, if you really push me, I could give you 10 lectures on acrylic chemistry, but I promise I won't. It's highly transparent. It very easily responds to colors, so you can produce a huge range of colors. It has absolutely outstanding aging resistance. It's great stuff for use in, when, you, when you want aging resistance. It needs to be used with care because it's highly inflammable. They, those again, those of us of a certain age may well remember the, the, the story of the Isle of Man um, complex which caught fire back in the 1960s and killed a lot of, and killed a lot of people because they used acrylic sheet, non-fire non retarded acrylic sheet. You can machine it. It's very easily glued. It's got quite a high dielectric constant because it's got a, a oxygen in it uh, and it's got quite a high dielectric loss. So it has lots of applications, but tends not to be used as a capacitor dielectric. Uh, one of the earliest applications, earliest developments was um, aircraft canopies. Uh, when pilots in the Battle of Britain got, got shot down uh, or got shot up, the, the fragments of the, of the canopies would sometimes end up in their eyes. And the people at East Grinstead who were, doing, who were putting them back together discovered that the eye didn't respond, that it was completely inert. And so if you have cataracts these days and you need a replacement lens, then you'll get a perspex lens or something related to an acrylic lens put into, put into your eye. Polyvinyl chloride is another one of these high, t high glass transition rigid materials. If it's, if it's as formed, it's a, it's a stiff, rigid material. It gets huge range of applications in things like pipes, uh, we would be hard pressed to put together a modern building without PVC. It's the material of all our sewage pipes and, and all, our, all our waste pipes and all the guttering and, wind, and all our window frames. It's also by far and away the safest place we've yet found to put all the waste chlorine from the alkali industry. The alkali industry produces a lot of chlorine and most of the things we've thought of doing with it have turned out to be a bit of a disaster. Uh, it dissolves very easily in all sorts of solvents. So you can make cements and you can solvent weld it. it. It yellows very easily. Early PVC was notorious for, early white PVC was notorious for turning a dirty yellow color. It has a very high dielectric constant because of that, um, because of that chlorine and a sort of moderate dielectric loss. It's a bit of a strange material in, in terms of fire. Uh, PVC doesn't burn. It's very good from the point of view of the of electrical safety if a building catches fire because it chars, but the char hangs around on the cable and stops and, and remains an insulator. So you don't get copper wires collapsing and touching each other and making things worse. What it does do when it gets into a fire is pour out huge quantities of hydrochloric acid, which if you've got a lot of delicate electronics around is not necessarily the greatest idea. 
So you find these days that, that PVC tends to be rather banned around, around electronic equipment, particularly in, in, in computer installations and, and server installations. They all demand halogen-free cable these days, as, as does the underground. One of the differences between PVC and other polymers is that it's a very good solvent. Most polymers are not very good solvents. PVC is, you, it will dissolve lots of things. Uh, you can put relatively high molecular weight materials into it and soften it. You can drop, you can bring the glass transition temperature of PVC down from around 100 degrees for the unplasticized to around minus 20 or so for the softened material. So you can make soft, flexible, glossy fabrics. Uh, if you're into making kinky boots, then PVC is the material for you. If you're into cable insulation, it's, 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 the work, it's the workhorse of all our cable insulation for uh, main, mains voltage uh, operations. Um, and of course, it makes very good flexible tubing. So that's an example. What about these semi-crystalline materials? Well, they're tough, much more tough than, 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 than the, 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 the amorphous materials. They're mostly thermoplastics, not always. You can't, thermo, you can't thermally process cellulose. You do again need to be very, very careful. You generally you, you gain in toughness. These materials will, will, will stretch to a great extent without uh, failing, without tearing apart. But the crystallinity does mean that you pay a price in terms of clarity. You, it's difficult to make a semi-crystalline polymer that you can see through. They're, they're nearly always uh, translucent or, or, or opaque materials. But they are the materials that in many ways we, we value most. And as I said very early on, about half of all the plastic we make is polythene and polypropylene. Uh, polythene is the simplest polymer of all in some ways. In other ways, it's the most complex of all because you can make all sorts of different variations on the theme. It comes in huge numbers of different grades. It has a reasonable dielectric constant and very, and very low dielectric loss. And it was the material that essentially enabled the microwave operation. It was the material that, that enabled it to us, us to make cables that would carry signals that, that were usable for radar and TV. Uh, it was one of the things that contributed to the Second World War was the development of radar. And the development of radar essentially required the development of polythene to provide the, the cable insulations for it. Uh, polypropylene is, is very analogous. It's much stiffer than polyethylene. And whereas polythene doesn't form a good fiber, polypropylene does. You can spin polypropylene and stretch it to make very, very strong fibers. Uh, and of course, it's the material that's, that's used a great deal in producing all sorts of, all sorts of ropes. Uh, it has very poor aging resistance. Unless you actually go to some trouble to stabilize it, it's, it's, it has very poor aging resistance. It embrittles in light. And of course, it's now becoming a major source of pollution. Polyethylene bags all over the place, uh, plastic all over the place in pollution. We've, as with most things, we've abused it rather badly. Delrin, again, a useful plastic, uh, machinable, high dielectric constant because of the oxygen in it, uh, relatively high dielectric loss used for things like gear wheels and me mechani mechanical parts in all sorts of radio applications and all sorts of other applications. Teflon, absolutely outstanding aging resistance, outstanding solvent resistance, lowest coefficient of friction of any plastic known, about 0.05, impossible to glue, Relatively high dielectric constant, but very, very low dielectric loss. So very popular as a machinable material for making high frequency insulation. And it comes in a huge variety of rod, tube, sheet, all kinds of, of different forms. And there are lots of others. Nylon is a low, t low, low, temp low TG thermoplastic comes in all sorts of, of forms, lubricated versions, filled versions. The, the, out, the casing of your, of your uh, battery powered drill is glass filled nylon. Uh, has a big problem with poor aging resistance. Polyesters, terylene fiber, uh, 
uh, terylene film used as a capacitor dielectric, and right up to material like peak, which, is, which has a continuous use temperature of 250 degrees centigrade, if you can afford it. To finish off, let's talk, just, let me just mention these high, high glass transition thermosets. These are the materials that are amorphous, they have no crystalline order, very highly cross-linked, almost invariably very hard, rigid and brittle, unless you put toughening in, and very often used as a matrix to, 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 for reinforced composites. We can go back to the beginning where I started, phenolic resins, still being manufactured on a huge scale. Uh, chipboards and MDF are all glued together with, with, with phenolic adhesives. Uh, Tufnol for gear wheels and, and components, Formica, and of course printed circuit board, cheap printed circuit boards uh, made from phenolic composites. Crosslink polyesters, these are the things like P38 and plastic padding, the, the, the materials that you can form and, and, and cure in your own home, uh, and you can reinforce them with glass. In, in glass reinforced. And finally, the, the, the Rolls-Royce of these materials is the epoxy resins. Again, epoxy resins come in a huge range of different sizes and shapes, different technologies. Some will cure in five minutes, some will take a week to cure. Uh, unreinforced, they're used as adhesives and encapsulants. We wouldn't have integrated circuits without epoxy resins to encapsulate them in. Reinforced, they can be reinforced with glass, carbon fiber, Kevlar, uh, and they make the high end, not the highest end, the highest end circuit boards are ceramic, but, but they make high end uh, circuit boards. If you're going to machine these materials, the things to remember, plastics have downsides like everything does. Their expansion coefficients are about 10 times greater than metals. They're much, much poorer thermal conductors. So it's very much easier to get things hot while you're machining. It's very easy to get over localized overheating. Uh, it's, it goes without saying that the softening temperatures are generally much lower than metals, uh, and they're much more elastic. So what I've tried to do in, I hope, just about the right amount of time, is to give you, is to give you the 24 lecture course in, in, in 35 minutes. Uh, I hope you found some of that, at least of some interest. Uh, and I thank you very much for your attention and for coming along to hear me this morning. Thank you. Uh, does anybody have any questions you'd like to ask you? Dick ZS6BUN. Could you comment on the often quoted idea of putting a bit of plastics in a microwave oven uh, to see whether it's okay for RF applications? Yes, it's... it's if, if you want to get the full dirty story, look up, for any particular polymer, look up what's called the dielectric relaxation spectrum. You can take a piece of material and you can scan it in frequency from a few hertz to a few tens of gigahertz and measure the amount of energy that's absorbed. Uh, and you can do that as a function of temperature. Uh, and what you get is something that has huge peaks and troughs in it because essentially what you're doing is coupling the radio frequency energy to the molecular motion of the, of, of the material. So what the, what the microwave oven thing tells you is whether that material does or does not absorb energy strongly in the gigahertz region. It doesn't really tell you what it's going to do when you get down into the kilohertz region. Um, so you've got to be a little bit careful. But if you want a, a quick and dirty test and you don't have access to a dielectric spectrometer, which most of us don't, it's not a bad test. But it isn't going to give you the guaranteed answer. Right. So I wonder if you could tell us a little bit more about your impression of using materials like uh, PLA. PLA for radio stuff, because I have seen a lot of conflicting opinions, like it's good for, for stuff for outdoor casing, it's not good for outdoor casing. Okay, it's, it's, yeah, it's of course, it's pretty good low melting temperature, that's obvious, but yeah. PLA is, is a popular material with 3D printers, mm -hmm. I think for, for two reasons. One is that it has, it has a temperature and melting range uh, which, are, which work well for, for 3D printing, so you can print it well. It's also popular because it's, it's perceived as green, because it's, it's, it's not produced from oil, it's produced from cornstarch. Corn we don't really know terribly much about long-term aging stability in sunlight, because it's never, this, as far as I know, unless it's been done in the last few years, it hasn't really been studied very much. People have been much more interested in its biological degradation, because that's what it's being marketed as, a, biodeg as a biodegradable material. There are two problems with trying to understand the lifetime of any piece of plastic material. 
One is that the lifetime depends on how much damage you do while you're processing. So it, with 3D printing, you're taking this material and heating it up to a significantly higher than its melting point and extruding it as a thin film in air, as a thin fiber in air. And that's going to do damage. The other thing is that if, if you want a polymer to last outdoors, you need to stabilize it. Uh, it you, you can't go out and buy a sample of commercial polypropylene that doesn't have stabilizers in it to protect it against oxidation. Uh, and that stabilizer will be chosen according to the application. So if you, if you take a piece of polypropylene that was designed for use indoors and, you put it in, and, and it's not UV stabilized and you put it out in the sunshine, it's, it's going to degrade. So I don't think that's entirely the answer you're looking for, but, but essentially I think the problem is that, that you know, PLA is not just a name. It, 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 you have to ask the question, is this material stabilized? Is it intended for outdoor application? If it's not UV stabilized, it probably isn't going to last well. Yeah, good morning to you, uh, David Howell, M0 VTG. Um, back in the 1980s, I was involved um, with uh, the production of expanded polyurethane foam for packaging. And I was told that it had to be that this process had to be done outside. It was two chemicals just to mix together in this swirly applicator. Um, I was told at the time that it gave off cyanide compounds. Just how dangerous is it to make almost any of these plastics? Again, it depends enormously on the plastic. I mean, polythene is pretty safe stuff. Uh, you don't want, you wouldn't want to run a continuous extruder in without a bit of ventilation because if. Uh, it, it's a problem. Engineers with plastics want to get them as hot as possible because they want the lowest possible viscosity so they can process rapidly. If you look at something like uh, uh, polythene coated paper for, for packaging of orange juice, they, they coat that at, at ridiculous speeds. I mean, these paper comes flying through the machinery with polythene being, being, coat, being coated onto it at a phenomenal rate because the stuff has been heated to a very high temperature. Under those conditions, you're going to get degradation products. The polyurethanes are, are certainly not at the, at the nice end of the spectrum. They, they contain isocyanates. And iso well, the, the reaction is an isocyanate alcohol reaction. And isocyanates are very reactive species, and they'll react with all sorts of things in your skin and your body. So I would certainly stay well away from them. You do see nonsensical things on the internet. People say, you know, you shouldn't burn polystyrene because it gives off cyanide. Well, that's nonsense. There's no nitrogen in, there's no nitrogen in it. But polyurethanes in, in fire situations are very nasty material. They do produce a lot of very toxic smoke. I would be very coy. I mean, I would personally would never handle a polyurethane resin or an epoxy without, without, plastic, without nitrile gloves. Uh, they're not nice for your skin. You can become very allergic to things like epoxy resins. So it's, it's usually the hardener, not the resin. Uh, but but you can, people, people who work with them a lot have, have become very allergic to the amines in, in hardeners. Jenny's down, G4HIZ. What I'm interested in is the stability of plastics in vacuum, having had an interesting experience with neoprene rubber. Generally speaking, if, you, if a polymer is kept free of, clear of oxygen and uh, cool, it's not going to degrade very much. However, when you start talking about these soft materials, they may well have low molecular weight species dissolved in them to, I mean, the, the classic examples are things like cellulose acetate, which was used to make you know, all sorts of things, it's imitation tortoise shell. It's showing up huge problems in museum collections now because the plasticizer that was in it evaporates and, and the material shrinks and becomes hard and brittle and, and cracks. And there have been lots and lots of examples of things of that kind that have, that have failed. Generally speaking, that's what's going to be the problem in vacuum, I think, unless you've got radi high levels of radiation of some sort around. Okay, so given some neoprene rubber coated waveguide uh, in a vacuum chamber, when we opened the chamber door, out ran the neoprene. So what happened there? Was it sublimation or did it just... I have really no idea. You'd have to look a bit more carefully. I'd have to look a bit at that. I mean, it sounds as though it wasn't very well vulcanized in the first place. It should be a, essentially a cross-link network that will will be perfectly stable. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much for your questions. And thank you, Norman, once again for uh, answering them and for your uh, presentation.